This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Hey, hey, we've got a legend on the show today. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, the host of the Emmy-nominated podcast Star Talk, and the recipient of 21 honorary doctorates. He also has an asteroid named in his honor, which is amazing. His latest book is right up our alley on this show. It's called Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. It's basically about how taking a scientific perspective can improve your life and, by the way, improve the world. In this conversation, we talk about applying a scientific lens to your emotions, the importance of intellectual humility, a big theme on this show, how the knowledge of death brings meaning to life. We talk about Neil's personal mental health regime, and then we ask some Big picture questions like, does he think there's intelligent life in the universe? Are we living in a simulation? And uh, his very long view of social media. Just to say, this is the second in our Bold Face series, which we're running in May, where we talk to famous people who have something to teach us about how to do life better. All month long, we're doing celebs on Mondays and then Dharma teachers on Wednesdays for a breakdown of the great Buddhist list, the Noble Eightfold Path. So let us know what you think of this little weave we're doing. Neil deGrasse Tyson, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. So Starry Messenger is such an interesting book, and I'm curious, how would you describe the thesis of this book? Well, I just remember as a kid, I was a geeky kid. You know, I knew that I liked science from very early, beginning age nine, I would say. By age 11, the universe was so compelling to me, and then I learned you could do it professionally so from that age onward, I had an answer for that annoying question adults always ask kids, which is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so I'd say astrophysicist. And that would typically end the conversation right there. <laughs> there was no comeback. Oh, Aunt Matilda is an astrophysicist. No, no, it, that, that's not the case. <laughs> but what that meant was I was able to see the world through sort of a scientific rationalist lens as a child rather than waiting until I'm an adult. And in so doing, I began to notice that so many forces operating in our civilization uh, put into play by adults defied any kind of rational sense or any kind of like, why? What are you doing that for? Don't you understand? Like, and I was very frustrated by this. In one particular case, there was a comet that was headed towards the sun. We discover hundreds of comets a year. Back then, maybe five comets, 10 comets a year. This one had great promise that as it got closer to the sun, it'd get very bright and everyone would see it. But it was still only a telescopic object at the time, but it had already made headlines. I'm in the street, I'm 14 years old, and there's a full grown adult holding a placard saying the comet is coming, repent, the end of the world is near. And I'm thinking, this is a grown up person, like what? Don't they understand what comets are and how frequent they are and how many there are? And to see this, I said, oh, my gosh, society needs some kind of a calibration on what we think is true versus what is objectively true. And ever since then, I've been observing civilization. My father's a sociologist, so he observed civilization and people's interpersonal relations, cultural political, economic. So that was kind of my baptism into thinking about society. But this book is basically a lifetime of insights and observations on the conduct of civilization in the face of objective truths that would have it take other tracks. That's a very long answer, I'm sorry, but that's the origin of this book. With each chapter, focusing on something that typically we dig our heels in and hold very strongly held opinions about. And I think we've lost sight of what it is to have an opinion versus what has no right being an opinion because we have objective truths that say that you can't wish this, you can't wish this world if it involves objectively false realities. Find something else in which to invest your opinions. And so it's an attempt to 
like I said, to calibrate the arguments people tend to have over holiday dinners <laughs> and possibly soften the strongly held opinion that you had, not realizing that it really had no foundation at all. The foundation wasn't as strong as you thought it was. And in other cases, you find that, sure, you can have an opinion, but that doesn't mean you're right. It means someone else's opinion might one day be shown to be right as well. So have a conversation about it rather than invoke declarations that whatever does not agree with you must be wrong. And so to tie a bow on what I just said wordedly is when two scientists argue, there's an implicit contract. Either I'm right and you're wrong, you're right and I'm wrong, or we're both wrong. We know that going in. Now, how often do you see that when two people are set up for a formal debate? They will go to the end, to their grave, defending the position that they went in there to defend. I've never seen a debate where someone says, you know, I never thought about it that way. I agree with you. Let's go have a beer. That is said no one ever in the history of debates. So that means they have a lot invested in their point of view being right, rather than instead being invested in what is objectively true. And therein may be the source of most conflict, not only societally, but around the world geopolitically. So would it be safe to say that what you're arguing for is intellectual humility? I think that's a as a minimum, as a minimum. I would say emotional humility as well, because often arguments are presented with a passion. And passion is good. You know, it motivates us. It keeps us going when you might otherwise give up. I don't have any problem with passion, but when you start attaching passion to something that can be objectively resolved, then you might not be as receptive to learning that you're wrong. So yes, it's intellectual humility, but it's also emotional humility. And maybe they work together in this regard. So yes, yes. In my field, we know enough about the universe to quantify how much we don't know. <laughs> and there are two things, we don't have to get into the details of this, just take it. There's dark matter, dark energy, two things that are driving 96% of the phenomenon of the universe and we have no idea what's causing it. You can't be an astrophysicist walking around with your shoulders popped saying, yes, we are masters of the universe. No, no. We know that there's more we don't know than we do. And we can quantify it. Not only that, if we ended up learning those new things, we might put us on a vista where we can see farther than we can right now and realize there's that much more we don't know. That can still happen. As the saying goes, as the area of your knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of your ignorance, that edge between what is known and unknown in the universe, that grows right alongside it. So yeah, yeah, how to soften arguments. That could be another, another title for the book, <laughs> rather than cosmic perspectives on civilization. I think most people will agree, at least in theory, with the call for this intellectual slash emotional humility. I read recently that somebody asked St. Augustine, the great Christian theologian, for some life advice, and he said three things, humility, humility, and humility. I believe St. Augustine is also the guy who advanced the theory of original sin, which seems to me, if not fully provably wrong just kind of obviously wrong and harmful. And so he might have benefited from taking his own advice. But I think most people will agree with the call for this humility. And yet most people are not scientists. You're a scientist. You knew it early on. You have, I would imagine, we don't know each other, but I would imagine you have the character of a scientist, the rationality of a scientist. I do not. And the rest of us are not all and I'm not calling you this, but Dr. Spock, you know, the rest of us do run hot um, on occasion. So how scalable is your advice really given human nature? Yeah, I'd love that line of inquiry. I think it's fully scalable, all right? So let me first say that though I'm a fully trained scientist, 
I'm still a human being, and human beings collectively have certain susceptibilities to over-investing in what we want to be true. The difference is, as a scientist, I have extra checks and balances on that. So I'll come up with an idea, and I'll say, you know, I wonder if there's a bias that leads me to think this idea. So I'll go to a colleague. This is a mini version of peer review. And I say, what do you think of this idea? And it's their job. It is their job to attack my idea at any weak point that they can see. There's a huge misconception. I think it's it's fed by journalists who might lead off an article saying, a new result might have to send scientists back to the drawing board who have to revisit their cherished theories. Like, we're all sitting there at a shrine, all worshiping the same idol, and then some new thing shows up at the door, and all of a sudden we're flustered. All right, have to go back to the drawing board. We're always at the drawing board. And the most fertile scientific conferences are the ones where there is vibrant disagreement on the frontier of discovery. The best thing you can do for me as my colleague is point out my errors. You do me no favors by saying, well, no, he's sensitive and he's emotional and he's this, so let's not tell him that he's wrong. No. So collectively, we know we are susceptible to our own bias and we take active measures to either remove it or diminish it to as small as possible. The reason why I think that's scalable is yes, I'll do that with any thought that I have, but in principle, you can invoke that on single thoughts you might have in a day, okay? Just one one argument you're having with someone, just pause and say, hmm, how sure am I of this? Even if it's not an argument, how, how complete is this idea that I'm now adopting as part of my life or part of my routine and you know, my behavior going forward? Okay, I'll give an example. This is directly from the book. A little bit obscure, but it touches on a lot of these points. There's a chapter called Meatarians and Vegetarians, or right, contrasting the two dietary pathways that generally people split and divide themselves along those lines. So suppose you're a vegetarian, and one of the reasons is you just don't want to kill animals. Okay? That's your reason. And animals to you are something special or precious or sacred relative to plants. So, all right, that person probably has a humane mousetrap in their basement if they live in a house with a basement where mice might come in. And a humane mousetrap, it traps them, doesn't kill them, but you got to check on them every few days because they can dry out very quickly. They have a high metabolism. So you better check on them. And then what do you do? You take the, the box and you open the lid and they escape back into the wild where they came from. And you feel good about this. Okay. Have you thought that through? Is in my point. As a scientist, I'm saying, all right, you like the mouse. You want it to live a long, healthy life instead of snapping its neck in a mouse trap. Okay. Well, you realize a mouse in the wild, the life expectancy is anywhere from nine to 18 months. Tops, two years. Why? Because they get eaten. They're tasty snacks for owls and hawks and crows and, and foxes and all manner of woodland predators delight in mice as a snack. So the best thing you could do for the mouse is let it live in your basement okay, where it's warm and dry. In fact, a mouse in captivity lives up to six years. So do you really have the health and well-being for the mouse in mind when you do this. Not only that, you're probably living in a house made of wood, right? Two by fours and wall boards and floor planks and, and structural members. And by my count, your house is probably made from the wood of 50 trees. Each probably would live 100 years. Each tree living longer than you'll ever live. And those trees, when they were alive, were home to insects and, and fungus and, and squirrels and birds. And through their natural process and photosynthesis, they produce 
15 times the mass of that mouse in breathable oxygen every day. Yet you cut down all those trees to build a house for you to live in so that you can save a one ounce mouse. So for me, if I'm going to create a life path, given my faculties as a scientist, I'm going to think through all elements of it. And it's not hard. Just ask yourself, who do I think nature cares more about? The 50 trees, each living 100 years, providing homes for countless insects, or the one ounce mouse? But you've judged the life of that mouse to be greater than the life of trees that outlive mice by 50 to one every time. So this is an example of bringing sort of a rationalist thought with objective truths as their foundation to decisions you might be making in this world. And the entire book is full of those, full of them, cosmic perspectives on civilization. So, yeah, I think it's scalable. At least start with some arguments you might have had at Thanksgiving dinner and take it up from there. How optimistic are you that we can move the whole culture, the whole society, especially right now, given how we are at each other's throats, we're structurally incentivized to have beef, right? And not in the vegetarian way. And given the social media fueled tribalism that we're seeing sort of abroad in the land, how optimistic are you that we can inject or scale up this rationalist or cosmic perspective? Yeah, I don't need the whole world to be rationalist. That would be a pretty boring place. I think so much of human emotion fuels our creativity. Uh, it's what makes people and institutions and life interesting. It's where conflict comes in, which of course also involves emotion. So I just want to make it clear that I'm distinguishing these elements here. This tribalism that's created this division, we can quantify that, okay? Let's quantify it. If there's protesters, this is not a story, unfortunately, that we're making up. This has actually happened. There are protesters in the street. Someone gets a car and drives full speed into them, kills eight or a dozen protesters, okay? This is a month's headlines in the local papers. It's a week's headlines in the nation, and it's maybe a day's headlines internationally, okay? This is tragic, and it came about from hate and intolerance. All right. 80 years ago, we were in the Second World War. Now, you can do the math. Between September 1939 and September 1945, 1,000 people were killed per hour for every hour of that war. So I ask you, are we better off today? Or in 1943. So, yeah, if the worst is some angry people on Twitter and then they get canceled, if that's the worst we can report for disagreements today relative to 80 years ago, or even the First World War, which was nearly as bloody as the Second World War, we're doing better. It's hard to admit that, but we're doing better by almost every objective measure related to health and longevity and cooperation. And basically all of Europe is at peace with itself. Has that ever happened? Yes, we have this in Russia, Ukraine, but Russia I'm not including as Europe, okay? Europe is at peace with itself. Name a time in the last thousand years where that was true. You can't. So yes, when you're living in the moment, everything feels worse than ever. But I do a fair amount of reading of the history of people and cultures and civilizations and how we treated one another and what role science played in either bringing peace or bringing war, all right? And so that's one view I have on your point. Back to the fact that we have systems in place that foster disagreement, my hope is that that's a temporary state. Social media is still in its infancy. It's still being shaped by who we are and legislation that surrounds it. And we're still learning its power over us, over opinions, over politics, over 
you know, the geopolitics of the world, we're still learning. You know, when the printing press was invented, it would be at least a century, maybe two. I have checked when the, when the first broadsheet was printed before someone realized you can report news this way. Newspaper, not just printed paper. It took a century, right? Before someone thought that up. Well, how long have we had social media? You know, 10, 15 years in its current form? That's yesterday. So maybe we will mature out of these incendiary conflicts as we learn to interact with the very thing that we thought would save us, yet is dismantling the peace and tranquility and more importantly, the the civility that I think existed before it. Another point is, however hopeless it seems, I'm never dissuade by hopelessness. I don't want to say never, but if you have hope in some outcome, it's only because you have admitted you have no control over the outcome. Because if you had control, you would control it, okay? You would be actively controlling it. But what is hope? And it, it's, a, it's the same side of a coin with prayer. It's hope and prayer. That's why you hear them together. Hope and prayer are like, I'm not in control. So all I can do is hope or pray for this outcome. Here's an obscure example. The pitcher in a baseball game does not bless himself before he throws a strike because a pitcher can throw a strike on command. On command, they can throw a strike. A batter, the best batters there ever were in the history of baseball, bat at a 30% average, 70% of the time, all right, they're not getting a hit. So the entire statistics of their presence at home plate is against them. They're hoping and praying that they're going to get a hit. And so there's the batter blessing themselves at home. They hit a home run, they bless themselves twice. Okay. So uh, they were not in as much control of the outcome as they wanted. So they rely on hope and prayer. But what I'm saying is I'm reminded of some of the lyrics of the song to dream the impossible dream. I forgot who wrote that, forgive me, but it appeared in the Broadway musical uh, Man of La Mancha about Don Quixote. It's a story of Don Quixote, and there he is with his joust or whatever the stick is, and there's a windmill, and he wants to defeat the windmill. Well, that's stupid. The windmill's not even a, another knight on a horse. What are you doing? What, what this is this? And then you realize this is metaphor for confronting a challenge that may seem impossible to overcome. And that song contains juxtaposed phrases, not the exact lyric, but it's in the spirit of the lyrics, and be strong enough to move the immovable object, to stop the irresistible force. And one of my favorite lines is, I want to march into hell for a heavenly cause, right? Just because something is presented to you as impossible or insurmountable is not reason enough to not attempt to conquer it. And that is a bit of sort of social, cultural wisdom I keep within me. Because otherwise, you know, just go home, just go leave earth, go somewhere else. If you don't believe you can change things that need to be changed, then nothing changes. Because maybe there's a solution you'll think of tomorrow that you never imagined was there yesterday. Give yourself some credit for ingenuity. And there are very real changes over the centuries. And no sanctioned country in the world is slavery endorsed. Whereas not long ago, you couldn't say that. That's a real shift in how people interact with other people. Yeah, we're still killing each other. But other people say, yes, you should be my slave and I will own you. No, no, that doesn't happen. No, not in any legit country in the world. So yes, we can change as a species, as a culture. And so... Yeah, I'm good for it. So just to say, much of what you just said was actually quite a beautiful delivery of perspective on what ails us currently. And I'm wondering, we spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of this conversation talking about taking a rationalist approach to things. You also talk about having a cosmic perspective. And I think the overarching point you're making here is we should have a cosmic perspective is 
being rational just a part of that? Yes. And again, I don't want to overstate the value of being rational. Some of the most fun people I've ever hung out with were just simply not rational. They're spontaneous. They do things that might even be a little dangerous, but at the end, they have a whole story about it the next day. Rationality has great value. I don't think it should be people's goal. Again, I don't want to tell people. People make decisions about their own life. What I want to do is display the causes and effects of thinking one way versus another, and then you decide. So the book, Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization, if it's anything, it's what the world looks like when you peer through a lens of science, okay? Science literacy. And nearly everything looks different. And science is one of the great triumphs of civilization, that it exists at all. It shapes the very world we live in. So much of what we care about and value in how we live comes to us from science. Not only from our health, we are living twice as long on average as people did in the year 1900, okay? And you go back to the 1850s, the life expectancy was like in the 30s. It didn't improve much since cavemen. So the advances in medicine and in sanitation, health in general, and communication, this is all engineering and science. So now, realizing what it has done for us, take that lens, now look through it at things you're doing in your day. Yeah, you're saving the mouse, but you're cutting down 50 trees to live in the home that the mouse walks into. Have you thought about that? Um, what else are you doing? Oh, our brain is badly wired to think statistically about things. Unfortunately, I, it's just, we're stuck with it. That's the hand we're dealt as humans. We are bad at thinking probabilistically and statistically about everything. Oh, by the way, an entire industry has arisen to exploit that fact. They're called casinos. Oh my gosh. There you are at the roulette table betting on seven. I say, why are you betting on seven so many times in a row? Well, it's due. Well, so how do you know? Well, look at the previous rolls, which they will show you at the roulette table. And the last 20 rolls, the seven hasn't come up. It's due. No, it's not. It's not due. Every roll has the same probability of rolling a seven as any, but you don't know that because it's, you're operating on your feelings of what should be true, not on the reality of it. That's a scientific lens that if you're not equipped with, others will exploit the absence of your scientific lens. Now, you have to be a scientist, just be scientifically literate. Now, ascend from that, and now you see Earth as this ball in space, adrift in darkness, with, as Carl Sagan said, with no hint of help from elsewhere coming to save us from ourselves. All right? That's a cosmic perspective. That rises up beyond your dinner table and your Thanksgiving arguments, then you go geopolitical on that one. It's like, oh my gosh, here's earth as only nature intends you to see it with oceans and land and clouds. Does it look like that schoolroom globe we grew up with, color-coded with countries? It wasn't until I was an adult, a cynical adult, I looked back on those years and I said, why do they color code the ball? Oh, I know why. So they can point to who our enemies are. And they were setting me up for geopolitical conflicts, all right? And, and I'm angry that this was a part of that indoctrination because Earth in all its beauty has no national boundaries and we are all one species. And if you come at it from that point of view, everything looks different. And that book, is, it was my attempt to have you join in the celebration of how and why all that looks different. Are you able to apply a, a cosmic perspective to the daily annoyances of life? Yeah, I mean, so it's a, like I said, it's a combination of a science literate outlook and a cosmic perspective. A cosmic perspective allows you to make a more accurate measurement of things that might bring you down emotionally. You just step back and say, well, what else is happening? And I'm getting upset at this, but why am I not getting upset at that? 
All right. Um, and by the way, we live in a free country. People should do whatever they want. But if you do what you want, at least be informed about it. Okay. Are you really stepping over a homeless person in the street to go to a pet shelter to rescue a puppy, to bring it into the warmth of your home and feed it for 13 years until it dies? Are you self-aware that you stepped over other members of your own species to do this for a puppy? Okay, if you're self-aware, fine. Like I said, it's a free country. And so maybe you just simply don't care about other humans or you think they're the source of their own, their own misfortune, okay? There's an actual twist on that religious quote where you see someone impoverished in the street or someone down on their luck or down on everything. And there's there but for the grace of God go I. Okay, we've all heard that phrase. And it has a little bit of literary complexity, so it's not as easy to understand when you're a child. But when you get a little older, sure. Well, the formal equivalent of that is here, but for the wrath of God, goes him. Okay? <laughs> that is logically the same construction. Okay? And so... When I take that view, okay, I ask myself, maybe I can do more for this person in the street than I am currently doing. It opens your eyes when you have these other perspectives. Just invert it. Take a look at it from a distance. Put yourself in the situation that you are attacking. Uh, my father was active in the civil rights movement, and there was some ugly moments over those years, the 1950s and 60s, and he was never bitter, never. And my brother, sister, and I, I think, learned, if not explicitly, but implicitly from this, because you end up recognizing there are people, you know, the ones who opened the hoses on the protesters or the ones screaming racial epithets at the school children in Alabama just trying to go to school, and it required the National Guard to escort them into a school to learn because others didn't want them in the same classroom. Okay, you look at this, my father would say, they were raised that way. They don't even know any better. The tribalism that we know is deep in us in some way. I shouldn't use the word tribalism because there are many tribes that are just nations, right? Tribal nations and native states of the United States. So we're giving the word tribe a bad name, using it in that context. Why don't I say this in-group, out-group, all right, sense of the world can rear its ugly head. But if you knew nothing else, then how else do you expect them to behave? Of course, they're going to behave that way. So that means you have to open it up for conversation. No, you don't bring weapons and shoot them. You say, come into this room, let's have a conversation. That's where it starts. Without that, it's weapons. And then we get war because one side is different from the other side. I'd like to think we're, we've matured beyond world wars. As Einstein said, I don't know how World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Coming up, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about applying a cosmic perspective to life and death and how death brings focus and intensity to your life. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. With our busy and hyper-connected lives, it's easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. And before you know it, you're stretched too thin, maybe even burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you don't leave yourself behind in the midst of taking care of everybody else. I personally am extremely grateful to my therapist who helps me with all sorts of issues, including avoiding burnout, which we've as a team been semi-successful in. Sometimes I still fall into that rut. Old habits are hard to break, but nobody's offering perfection here. We're just offering better tools for managing the inevitable vexations and vicissitudes of being alive. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can also switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash happier today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash happier. 
If you've been wanting a straighter smile but are put off by the thought of the endless trips to the dentist or the high cost of braces, then I know just what you need. Bite. Bite offers clear teeth aligners that allow you to transform your smile from the comfort of your home. Bite clear aligners are doctor-directed and delivered right to your doorstep. Just take an impression mold of your mouth, preview your 3D smile, and order your all-day or at-night aligners. Yes, it really is that simple. Best of all is that their thousands less than braces, have monthly financing options, and even take insurance. Spring is a time for new beginnings. Start your smile journey today. Go to BYTE.com and use code WONDERY at checkout to get your at-home impression kit for just $14.95. That's code WONDERY at Byte.com for over 80% off your impression kit. Let me just go back to you for a second. I'm really curious about your state of mind on a moment-to-moment basis. When some annoying shit happens for you, can you view it from the perspective of some other galaxy where it's like, okay, well, it's maybe not that big of a deal? Yeah, so there's a subtle point here I don't think I made clear, so thanks for asking that very precise question. When I encounter issues in society, be they cultural, ethnic, you know, you see a bit of regressive behavior in people, I don't say, well, in the big picture, it's not, no, 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 no. But nor do I say, oh my gosh, this is affecting me emotionally. I need a quiet moment. As an educator, but also as a general observer, acute observer of everything I can, just as a scientist, the world is this laboratory, right? And you observe it. Oh, is the bird on this branch, but not the other? And it's flying this way, but not this way? Oh, the worms come out after the rain. I wonder why that happened. Oh, this, you know. You, you think about your environment. So I think good scientists never turn off their sense of curiosity. So a scientist is just a kid who never really grew up, okay? They're still curious about everything, except they have more powerful and expensive tools to probe them, telescopes, microscopes, laboratories, this sort of thing. So there's a difference, I would say, between having it affect you emotionally and I, as an observer, I make note of it and I say, okay, in this situation, this person behaved in that way. Can I fold that into a lesson that I bring to others? Will it become anecdote? Will it shape the next post that I make on social media? Because there are people out there that think this way. Should I address them? Should I ignore them? So I'm strategizing as I observe conduct that is exhibited by people, especially if it's regressive conduct. And so I fold it into the next things I do when I interact with the public. But no, I don't, I don't want to call it an emotional shield because that implies it would otherwise penetrate me, but it doesn't. I'm saying that it's more valuable to me to log it as something that humans are capable of doing and saying and thinking and using that to navigate future interactions with humans. So in that sense, no, I'm not preventing it from reaching inside me. It was never headed that way to begin with. I was never that susceptible. Tell me if this is an appropriate connection I'm making here, but Buddhists, I mean, I count myself as one, think about everything, including people, as being governed by the law of cause and effect. This happened, therefore that happens over and over and over again, oceans of causes and subsequent effects. And so when you're looking at people and their behavior, you can understand, just as your father did, about the people turning on the hoses, that maybe if I came out of that womb and had that upbringing, I'd be doing the same abominable things. Yeah, so what concerns me about anyone who says, Buddhists believe this, or anything believes that, Okay, I will, the sentence will never come out of my mouth. Scientists believe that, no, okay? Science only works at all because we don't all believe the same thing on the frontier. We're thinking different things and only one of them or, or some variant of the one thing is gonna be the right path as supported by evidence. And so what I'm saying to you is we have discovered, not to get all modern physics on you, We have discovered that quantum physics, there are phenomena that take place that have no known cause. If you invoke as a prerequisite that everything must have a cause, then you could end up trying to find solutions that don't apply 
in situations where there's no obvious cause to it at all, okay? So there's certain human behaviors that are not triggered by some event that happened in their lives. They're just deep within us. We can say, well, the cause is a billion years of evolution. Okay, we can say that, and there's a cause. Okay, but that's not a cause accessible to your actions in the way you were making that claim. If it's a cause, then that they did this because this happened to them, or no, there are things that can happen without any obvious cause. It is not a law of the universe, cause and effect. Let me just put it that way. So therefore, no, I don't run around thinking that way. But yes, it applies in so many cases that we do have control over. So I'm only speaking to you in the absolute terms, not in the individual occasions where it is actually the true thing that you have power to influence. In your book, you talk about applying the cosmic perspective to life and death. Can you talk about that here? Yeah, sure. So one of the chapters is life and death, right? How could that not be something that I address in this book, which preoccupies us all in profound ways? So what I do there is take what science can say about it, what a cosmic perspective can say about it, and offer it to you. And it'll either bring value to your life or insights or, or not, but it's nonetheless objectively true. And so you can receive that in whatever way matters in your life. What's objectively true is, well, apart from your body decomposing in the earth, if you're buried, all right, uh, I want to be buried, by the way, when I die. I don't need my burial ground, the location remembered, because I don't care. But I want to be buried because my whole life I have consumed flora and fauna. These are living things in the tree of life, the flora and fauna, that I have consumed that have brought nourishment to my body. If I'm buried, that nourishment, what's left of that nourishment on my deathbed, gets returned to the environment as worms and microbes and other subterranean creatures dine upon my flesh, as I have dined upon their flesh my entire life. So for me, that's what I want to give back to all the life that I have consumed. Plant life, animal life, microbial life, all of the above. So now, that's just a personal thing. If you want to cremate, that's fine. Note that when you're cremated, the energy content of your molecules gets released. We have complex molecules that comprise life. And embedded in those molecules is stored chemical energy a lot of which we were running on when we were alive. When you die, the molecules just sitting there doing nothing. You introduce it to heat. The molecules break open and release more heat. This is how a fire can start and then keep itself going, right? There are molecules that are broken and the heat gets released. Your body in cremation will heat the air in the smokestack or however they vent it, and that will go to the atmosphere, heating the atmosphere, and then the energy of that heat in the form of infrared photons, to be specific, will be radiated out to space. So the energy of your content ultimately ends up traveling through space at the speed of light. And no, it's not going to recollect and form you again, but if you wanted to tour the universe in death, that's how you do it. You go walk right into a crematorium and you will ascend into the sky and into the vacuum of space moving at the speed of light. But for me, a more interesting revelation that science brings to us is to recognize that the human genome, and I credit the first thoughts on this to Richard Dawkins, and I've appended to it in my book here, but he's the originator of this outlook, that when you look at the human genome and you say, okay, how many possible ways can I configure the human genome and get a whole brand new other person? That's an interesting question. How many total humans are possible given the genetic variations in the genome? Well, there've been a hundred, approximately a hundred billion people who have ever been born. 
Now you run the numbers on the genome, and there's several ways you can do this calculation. All of them get different numbers, but all the numbers are vastly greater than the 100 billion who have ever been born. They're in the like quadrillions. The number of people who have been born is a minuscule fraction of all that could be born. So wait a minute. If that's the case, then the fact that you and I are alive at all is against the stupendous odds against us. The way Richard Dawkins put it, it's we're the lucky ones because we get to die. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, come on, come on, nobody wants to die. Most people who could exist will never even be born. So for me, knowing that, that's a cosmic perspective that comes to us from biology. And so knowing that, I'm alive when the chances are I would have never been born, which is true for all the other people who will never be born. Oh my gosh, I should cherish every moment I'm alive, no matter what hand I'm dealt, no matter what afflictions or ailments I confront. No matter how shortened my life is or will be from any disease I might encounter or might have, you're alive. You get to smell the roses. You get to see the sunsets. You get to experience all the discoveries about the natural world in ways that most combinations of that genome will never even contemplate because they will never even exist. And so in that line of reasoning, I have come to recognize that my knowledge that I'm going to die is the greatest force that gives meaning to my life. Because how much time do I have left? You know, you look at the actuarial tables. If you don't get hit by a bus, at least give yourself to the actuarial table. So I've got stuff I need to do before I die. And I'm actively engaged in it. Because I worry that if we find the fountain of youth and we live forever, if knowing you're going to die is what gives meaning and purpose to your life, then knowing that you'll never die mathematically would mean you'd live a life of no meaning at all. Because why do today what you can just put off until tomorrow? So the knowledge of death brings focus and intensity, which is, I think, how we should all live our lives. You have one chance through this. And then if you think this way, would you ever take up arms against another person? Prematurely ending their one chance to embrace this world. Are you going to give guns to people and say, shoot those people over there? If the whole world thought this way, life would be the most cherished thing there is. Yet there's entire institutions that view life as cheap. Well, a cosmic perspective says, no, it's not. It's the most valuable thing we own and we should cherish it. Coming up, Neil talks about uh, his personal mental health regime and whether he thinks intelligent life exists in the universe. I could not resist asking him that. to grow more vibrant plants. Just feed them with miracle Grow Shake and Feed. Shake a little around your plants once every three months and you're good. That's all you need to know. Not even sure what to talk about for the rest of this commercial. I guess I could list off my favourite plants. The weeping fig. Honeysuckles. Any kind of fern. I'm a sucker for a fern. Spider plants. Roses. Classic. Oh wait, I forgot to have to say the slogan too. miracle Grow. All you need to know to grow. On a cold night in 2010, a boy is stopped by the police while walking home from a party in the Bronx. He's only 16. He's been stopped by the police before, but this time is different. In a special four-part series, the Generation Y podcast unravels the story of Khalif Browder, a young boy who was falsely accused of stealing a backpack and held without bail at Rikers Island for three years. He endured regular abuse by prison staff and inmates and was held in solitary confinement for more than 700 consecutive days. 
Three years later, Khalif was released, never having stood trial. This is a story that digs into the injustice of the justice system and a young life caught in the middle. We say innocent until proven guilty, but where do we draw the line between due process and cruelty? To hear this four-part series, follow Generation Y wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. To quote you back to you, you say in the book, being alive is the time to celebrate being alive every waking moment. I'm curious, how good are you at applying your own advice here? Do you have times where you distractedly scroll through Twitter or get really impatient or overlook important events that are unfolding in front of your nose? Yeah, I try not to. So you do your best. You can overlook something, but if it happens to me, it's by accident because I forgot it or or I wasn't as sensitive to the needs of others as I should have been. Once you realize that, then you correct it or you put in reminders or whatever that is required. So it, it doesn't mean living a perfect life, but it shouldn't prevent you from trying to, right? That's back to the old, no one's perfect, but you can try to be perfect. And that has great benefits when you succeed in that one moment where everything goes just right. And also if I build into my life occasions where I'm doing nothing, I'm just staring out in the night sky and thinking, something that I think there's less and less of, because in the next generation, there's a screen in front of them at all times. I don't know what, what we'll learn from this, what the counselors and psychologists are saying about it. From what I've read thus far, it's not good that people are have access to everyone and are more isolated than ever before, and what the mental health consequences of that will be as they move through life, or will they just arrive at some other equilibrium with those media, as we did with the invention of writing? I mean, there was criticism when writing was invented. Well, this is going to be the, I forgot who said it, some famous philosopher of antiquity said, writing, this is going to be the end of memory. What reason would you ever have to remember anything if you can just write everything down? And this whole thing with storytelling, remembering and passing it from one generation to the next, you can write something down, it could skip a generation and it'll still be there. But no one was thinking that way at the time. So I don't know what the social media and these devices, what the long-term impact of that is, and maybe we're overreacting to it, the way the anti-writing people were overreacting. To, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the, the, that writing would somehow be the death of civilization. So I think that still remains to be fully researched and concluded and to see where that will land. So for me, oh, no, I don't mind reading Twitter. Entertainment has value too. I can watch a stupid movie. I'll do that. I don't see it as wasted time. If it's fun, things that bring joy to life. So when I say I'm going to die soon and I need to bring some intensity to my life. That doesn't mean everything, I got to get this done. Oh my gosh. No, no. It means not wasting time. You know, you're going to spend time doing nothing, at least have deep thoughts while you're doing nothing. Okay. And if you're having no thoughts at all, at least spend those time doing something fun, like on a roller coaster. No one has deep thoughts on a roller coaster. <laughs> you just you just don't want to die, you know, depending on the speed of the thing. So there, it's why we have things that entertain us. It serves needs of what it is to be human and what it is to be alive. But to sit on a couch and do nothing, serving neither your body nor your mind, no. Remind yourself that one day you're going to be dead. And there are people who might have wanted to have been born that might have been more productive than you in your slot. But you, you got that slot. So do something with it. Be more today than you were yesterday in whatever metric you invoke to make that happen. I'm curious for you, are there one, two, three, four non-negotiables when it comes to your recipe for positive mental health, things that you do in your life that are really important for keeping you sane? Depends what you mean by non-negotiables. For me, everything is negotiable. Non-negotiable, all of a sudden, you confront something that's different from it, and now there's an argument, right? So nothing, for me, I'll hear any argument about anything, okay? So maybe that's not what you meant. Maybe you meant, is there anything that's a fundamental part of my search for happiness? Yeah that I make sure to include in my life at all times. I have very deep roots looking up into the night sky. 
as a child with a telescope. So in my adulthood, if I need to sort of recommune with the cosmos, I'll pull out my telescope from the closet. I have a backyard telescope and I'll pull it out and I'll, you know, go somewhere quiet. And it's just me, my telescope and the universe. And I'm not in front of any large audiences giving a public talk. I'm not Professor Neil in, in a classroom. I'm not Cosmos Neil on a TV program. It's just Neil and the universe and this telescope, which is sort of a conduit to the cosmos. When I do that, it's my comfort food, if you will. I'm reminded of when I was a child, first discovering these things through my backyard telescope at the time. And it's it's a way to reset what might be the complexities of life, the problems that I needed to solve by now, but I haven't yet. And other people that need me to help them in family or friends or loved ones. So that's something I return to because I have it available to me. I also like reading old books written by people centuries ago to just watch how they were thinking about the world and compare how they're thinking about the world to how I think today in this, the 21st century. They have ideas that they thought were true that didn't turn out to be true, but look at how much they invested in it or how much they wanted it to be true. So how much today are we saying on the frontier of science that in a century from now, two centuries from now, we'll look back on and say, you know, no, that was quaint, what they thought way back in 2023. But no, no. So it's it's a way to embrace thinkers of the past and bring a sense of pride for what they got right, but a sense of humility for what you might have wrong as we go forward. So those two are very important for me. I also like curling up on a couch with family and watching a movie that we're overdue for having seen. Any kind, it could be comedy or drama, uh, science fiction, something that's a little bit escapist, but it helps you step into the lives of others and see the world through their lenses. That can always be helpful. Any good novel that becomes a good movie will do that. And I'm more likely to watch a movie of a novel than to read the novel <laughs> before the movie. So, I mean, a big part of my exposure to the human condition and how people feel and how they love and how they hate and why they do these things comes from storytelling, which I greatly value. Me too. Have you seen any space or sci-fi movies or TV shows of late that you recommend? Well, oh, that I recommend. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, or not? Actually, I'd be curious to hear ones that you don't recommend. The movie Armageddon, which Bruce Willis saves the world, came out in the 1990s. Um, that movie violated more laws of physics per <laughs> minute than any other movie I'd ever seen <laughs> until the movie Moonfall. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. That's when we learn that the moon is actually a hollow alien vessel and it's falling towards Earth. I just, wow, I didn't think anything could beat Armageddon. And there it was. You know, this is the, the plot line to any space movie is people go into space and something bad happens. That's the plot of every one. And for every disaster movie begins with a scientist warning the authorities and the scientist being ignored. Every disaster movie is that. So... Just to summarize them all <laughs> in that one sentence. We had all these stories recently about UFOs and Chinese spy balloons and the like. What is your personal take, given your vast amount of knowledge and study, about whether we're alone in the universe or not? Yeah, so those are two completely different questions. What are these things oh, that really? people can't identify that are floating around in our skies? And are we alone in the universe? Those are two completely different questions. But what's happened is those two questions, it's not your fault, those two questions have been conflated to the point where you can have a newspaper article that says government confesses that UFOs are real. That headline makes no sense at all in the following way. If you see a floating object up there, a UFO, and oh, by the way, they rebranded it as UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Who are they fooling, right? They mean <laughs> UFOs. So let's, let's just get that straight. <laughs> so if you see something you don't understand, 
and you don't know what it is. So the word you is there, unidentified, and it's some object and it's flying. You've just admitted you don't know what it is. You cannot then say, because I don't know what it is, therefore I know what it is. It's intelligent aliens visiting from another planet. You can't go from I don't know to I know, right? That's not, no, that's not how reasoning works. You can say, I don't know what it is. Let's investigate it further and see what it actually is, as we've done with this Chinese spy balloon and some others. There are others we didn't know what it was, and we're still looking for the remains or whatever. Fine. But the idea that we don't know something, therefore it's aliens, is an extraordinary leap that any sane skeptic is not going to take. They're not going to go there. I need better evidence. The most common atoms in the universe are the atoms that comprise life. You would have to be inexcusably egocentric to suggest that we are alone in the universe. So anyone who studied the problem is perfectly fine accepting the likelihood of life elsewhere. If not in our own solar system, certainly elsewhere in the galaxy. Do you reckon it's intelligent life? Most life on Earth we would not rate as intelligent, yet it's perfectly thriving, you know, four billion years after its genetic ancestors. So intelligence is not the measure of the success of a life form in any ecosystem. And intelligence, as we have come to know it, could contain the seeds of our own extinction. And the ecosphere would say, so how intelligent were you? when the rats and roaches are taking over your slot. So now I'm going to turn the question around on you and say, well, who defined us as intelligent? What's the answer to that? We defined we ourselves do. okay. as intelligent. So, we <laughs> so would we be considered intelligent on the scale of other intelligent creatures in the universe? That's a cosmic perspective of high rank. And I basically address that in the chapter Mind and Body, where our ego prevents us from even imagining that there are intelligent species out there who would not rank us in their club, that might see us as so backwards and so insignificant as to not even be interested in communicating with us. The next closest genetic species to us on Earth, chimpanzees, cannot understand our simplest thoughts. And so could it be that some intelligent life form out there that the smartest among us cannot comprehend their simplest thoughts. If that's the case, if they didn't want us to find them, we would never find them. So there's no reason to think there isn't life of all forms out there, possibly life vastly more intelligent than we are. What's your take on this popular idea that we're living in a simulation? Yeah, it's hard to argue against it. I do offer an argument against it in the book. Well, for those who don't know, the argument in support of a simulation is... Imagine a civilization that's smart enough and figures out how to make computers, and then for entertainment, they create worlds within the computers that are so complex that the characters in the world don't know that they're characters in the world, and they have what they perceive as free will. So those characters, over time, build computers. They invent computers, as we did, okay? And then the characters in those computers create a world, a universe, if you will, and then it's that all the way down. Let's say this repeats 100 times. Now close your eyes, throw a dart. Which universe are you likely to hit? The 99 that are simulations or the one that started them all? Statistically, you're going to be in the simulated universe. And this is a simple and powerful argument that we're in a simulated universe. But the argument I give in the book, which I think is the strongest among them, is when you program a computer, it only knows logical decisions. The computers don't have the baggage that our brain has where, oh, I have emotions and I feel this and I don't know if I should do this because I don't know because I've been, that the computer has no such limitations. So I'm thinking every world it creates will have rational things going on, the likes of which we do not see in our own world. So I call it the inanity defense. The inanity defense is, if this were a simulated world, there wouldn't be so much irrational behavior <laughs> exhibited by its residents. And so that's my best evidence that we are not a simulation. 
I'm going to use that next time I get into this discussion. But just a couple other questions. I before referred to the universe as being infinite or seemingly infinite. And is that actually true? Is the universe infinite to the best of our knowledge? There's a horizon beyond which we cannot see, but the universe continues beyond that horizon. It's like, it's, it's a literal horizon. If you're a ship at sea and you see to your horizon, are you saying to yourself, well, that's the edge of the earth. That's all there is. No, the ocean goes beyond that. And if you if you sail towards your horizon, you see more horizons show up until you get to land. So in the universe, there's a horizon. What the universe does beyond that, we may never know. Could it be infinite? Possibly. We don't know. And in science, at some level, you need to learn to love the questions themselves. What is that UFO? I don't know. Let's investigate. Where is the edge of the infinite? I don't know. Got top people working on it. That's what it is to be a scientist. You said a while ago, and I didn't follow up on it. I was talking about this Buddhist concept of cause and effect sometimes referred to as karma. You said before, cause and effect is not a law of the universe. It's helpful, and it gets you pretty far. But I'm just saying, if you're staring at a particle that's unstable, it will decay on its own terms without any cause triggering it. It's a purely statistical manifestation of nature. That's what quantum physics is. Things happen statistically. It just happens. Einstein went to his grave thinking quantum physics was incomplete, in need of some anchoring in objective cause and effect reality. The famous Schrodinger's cat is a cat in a box. It is simultaneously alive and dead until you make the measurement of whether it's alive or dead. But while it's in the box and before you looked at it, before you made the measurement of it, it is both alive and dead. And there are ways to show this experimentally. So I'm just saying you can make a statement that's been true so far, maybe. But what we've learned in science is for every next frontier that we step upon, there are new things that might violate some previously held law that you thought was a law. Law of conservation of matter. No, it's the law of conservation of matter and energy. Both. And so I'm not going to look to Buddhism and say, you're right about this in the universe. This is not how that works. It's possible that sometimes things happen for no reason with no cause. It happens all the time that way. Correct. In, in the quantum realm. Now, we can say, I can get you out of this and say, no known cause. Maybe one day we'll find a cause. But right now we don't know the cause. I'm telling you, you can sit there bare-assed, the particle sitting in front of you. And you're looking at it, and then, boom, spontaneously, it decays into two other particles. Boom. And not on your clock, on its own clock. And you didn't do anything. You didn't blow on it. You didn't do anything. No cause. Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. My final question is, can you just please remind us again of the name of your book and any other things you've written or resources you've created that you want to just remind this audience? Oh, sure. If, if anyone's interested, much of this conversation was derived from knowledge and insight in researching, preparing, and writing the book Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspective on Civilization. Starry Messenger is directly lifted from Galileo's first book called Starry Messenger, where he used a telescope to reveal things about the universe that people didn't know were true, or in a worst case, didn't want to be true, that Earth was not the center of all motion. And so the starry messenger is like, the stars are bringing messages to us that may disrupt your understanding of your place in the universe. And of course, he got into big trouble with the Catholic Church, and for a combination of reasons, including that he's finding things out that were inconsistent with what people were sure were true from biblical Genesis. And so one of my favorite quotes from Galileo is, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> Only he could say that because <laughs> he had his telescope, went up and looked at the sky. So without Galileo's permission, I'm borrowing the title of his book, Starry Messenger, because there are more messages from the stars in this generation, in this century, in this millennium, that can serve that same role that his discoveries serve in his generation. 
And I also have a podcast, Star Talk, which combines comedy, pop culture, and science. And so it's very irreverent, fun, and if you want to smile and laugh while you're learning some science, then that, that's definitely for you. And you can just go to my website, neildegrassetyson.com, and you can see books and other projects that I've been involved in, all in the spirit of bringing the universe down to earth for whoever will pay attention. <laughs> the good news is a lot of people are paying attention. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you very much. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Very cool to meet him. I guess for the second time I was on his show not long ago. Thank you very much for listening. Go rate and review us if you've got a second. That really helps us. And thanks most of all to everybody who worked so hard on this show. 10% Happier is produced by Justine Davey, Gabrielle Zuckerman, DJ Kashmir, Lauren Smith, and Tara Anderson. Our supervising producer is Marissa Schneiderman, and Kimmy Regler is our managing producer. Scoring and mixing by Peter Bonaventure of Ultraviolet Audio. And Nick Thorburn of the great band Islands wrote our theme. We'll see you all on Wednesday for a brand new episode. We're talking to the Dharma teacher, Eugene Cash, with part two of our Eightfold Path series. Hey, hey, Prime members. You can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in the U.S. history, presidential lies, environmental disasters, corporate fraud. In our newest series, we head back to 1968, a year of cultural and political turmoil in America. Riots and assassinations dominated the headlines, and as opposition to the Vietnam War continued mounting, thousands of protesters descended on Chicago for the Democratic National Convention. The event was billed as a demonstration against the war, but after clashes broke out with the local police, a group of activists was charged with federal crimes. They would take their case to court, setting in motion one of the most explosive legal battles of the 20th century. The trial of the Chicago 7 would come to highlight the stark cultural divisions across the United States and become a symbolic fight about the soul and future of the country. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.